What was that? Oh, this is um, actually just the computer recording the presentation. So, here. So, will the, these people be able to go online? And get um, I'm not sure right now. I think they're just recording it for future. You're recording that and our movements up here. No, it won't be. It's no, audio. It's just audio. Okay. <laughs> I was like, this is a new technology. No. <laughs> that would be a, that would be something that would be to create this okay. All right, as you guys are finding your seats, uh, actually, uh, Dr. Madison had one more comment that he wanted to make, and I'll hand him the mic here to do that. Thank you. If you're on social media, um, if you look, you can start using a hashtag or look for it if you don't know what that means, you know, and you've got a fourth grader in the house, they can help you, but um, look for a hashtag, yes, the word Y-E-S, number two, and then meet, M-E-A-T, yes to meet. And a group of people who are trying to push back against the Eat Lancet message are using that in their uh, tweets and Instagram and Facebook stuff. So, yes to me. Thank you. Okay, I would like to introduce uh, our next speaker, uh, Steve Campbell, the rancher and a consultant uh, from Idaho. Uh, Steve has been around cattle in one capacity or another since the age of 12. His epiphany moment, however, came in 1999 while recovering from a ranching, industry, ranching in injury. This caused a refocusing and redoubling of his energies into learning about soils, plants, animals, and human health since that time. That journey of discovery, which is still ongoing, has led him to some very old books, like-minded thinkers and mentors, and on-farm experiments, experiments with cattle and soil fertility. From the Weston A. Price philosophy for human health, to Kerry Reams and Maynard Murray for soils, to Jerry Pernetti, Dr. Richard Oldtree, Gerald Fry, Will Winter, and the teachings of numerous authors of yesteryear, Steve has spent that period learning from these wise men and women, not only to change his personal eating habits, which took away the pain modern medicine could not, but to extrapolate those learned principles of nature into his own farmland and animals and to consult with others looking to make similar improvements in their own farms and their families' health. He has spoken at many conferences uh, across the country. He is the owner of Taylor Made Cattle and Taylor Made Beef. And uh, one quote I found on his website that I fits uh, as we move forward here is making your herd's genetic code fit your zip code. Please welcome Steve Campbell. Thank you. Is this, can you hear me? Is it working? Do I need to move the mic? Does that work? I don't know. You, you can hear it there? Okay. You can turn it off. I don't know if I can turn it up. Um, can you hear it all now? Is that, that's yep. about as close as I can get it. Yep. Um, so I'm going to try to do in uh, 50 minutes or so what I usually spend a, a whole half a day doing. I, I tried to put three talks kind of into one here. Um, anyway, uh, a lot of things have... Uh, uh oh, I poked the wrong button. Something didn't happen. Okay, I've tried to... Tried to uh, Get what I thought was important. There's there's three three things here. I'm going to make a lot of these general uh, observations, but um, everything else being equal, I'm trying to pull it out and say, well, the rest of the cow is the same, and we're going to look at this part or this part or this part. So generalizations. Any one animal can turn this whole thing upside down, but in general, when you have a majority of the things I want to talk about, you're going to have the right kind of animal. Um, this is just saying, this is not the only way to get there. A lot of the people talk about a lot of other things. I guess I've kind of found my own little space to work in, which is uh, mainly with the cow or the bull. Um, so we have the problem of, uh, that I've delineated here. I, I don't know how many people have uh, a cow herd that the average age is uh, 
12 years and uh, all the first calf heifers bring back, yada, yada, yada. Most people are have some challenges out there. Uh, I would just like that uh, after the end of the day, you've got a few ideas to uh, see maybe your cow herd different, your management a little bit different, and uh, which ones to choose on the front end and then kind of see why maybe some things aren't working as you get through with the, those first calvers that you had to pull calves or the kind that you didn't have to pull calves. Um, and uh, I hate uh, I hate just reading off of a slide, so I usually just look up here down there to see what I've got going on. So the very first time I ever worked with Gerald Fry, we went to Valentine, Nebraska. Is that about streets out to where we are? Yeah. And uh, the first day we sorted through 1,400 head, pulled out 275. The next uh, two days we linear measured, ultrasounded the 275 we pulled out and 50 of those wouldn't work. But that first day by eye, we could see uh, about three quarters of the cattle wouldn't work for this meat program that uh, Gerald was trying to put together. I'm hoping that by the end of the day, by eye, you'll be able to do that through your own herds. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is uh, probably the best time for you to go out, or one of the best times for you to go out and look through your herd, is about a month before you get through the winter. Uh, how many in here don't have to feed any hay during the winter? Okay, so about a, hey, great. About a month before you finish feeding hay for the winter is going to be approximately the longest time on the poorest feed quality you've got and the toughest conditions of the year. That's when the, 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 your, your best hormonally functioning cows are going to show up. Uh, they'll start shedding that sort of thing. So, where are we at now? Uh, would that be middle of March? In, would, would that be about a month before you uh, you stop feeding hay here? I just pulled the number out of the air. Yes, no, yes, no. Okay, so about that time. So you've got about two months to think about what we're talking about. You, it's okay to look now, but that's going to be a prime time to, to look at some of these things. I got two deals here. So uh, anyway, this fellow called Gerald three and a half months later and said, I just sold 900 of those cows you didn't like because I could see all they were going to do is cost me money the rest of their life. That was pretty powerful to me to, uh, to be able visually to see the ones that weren't working. So I've got it in three parts, hormonal function, basically a body shape, and I've got flank top line differential there, and then and then what happens in the room, and um, I'm going to attack it slightly differently. But anyway, to begin with, hormonal function. And uh, you know, the, a lot of this stuff you haven't heard before uh, because it's been actively squelched at the university level. Uh, they really don't want you to know this because then you'll have to hire more nutritionists and veterinarians. But if you can pick up on a few of these things, this horse water thing, I was telling an Amishman in uh, Iowa about that, about somebody I was disgruntled with, and he goes, well, he said, that's true, but he, what I found is that if you put a little salt in those oats and then lead the horse to water, <laughs> you, well, hopefully there's a little salt going on there. <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of things out there that uh, we're looking at. We don't even know what they mean anymore. You know, these Kentucky coal miners, the, they're past the, why do we have that canary in here? Um, and then Yogi Berra, what he has to say. So this is out of Bonsma's book. And this is the uh, an outline of a uh, Senator Trudis cow that he bragged on a lot in his book and it's the shape of that cow and I'll get into that a little bit later. What he's trying to show here is what's happening in the animal. Some of these aerials go one way, some go the other way depending on on what's happening. Um, I've got these two pictures because I don't know if you can see it and I've got two things here I'm gonna try to keep track of but you see the uh, the long part in the forehead here that'll at the same time the pituitary is 
form, the testes and the ovaries are formed. So if you've got a problem uh, in this area, if you can see instead of just a dot, if you see this line, you know that you've got some uh, reproduction issues coming up. This fellow here was getting ready to sell that bull and he was just so proud of him. The other thing about him, it's, it's saying he's got reproductive issues. Look at all this hair standing up on his pole. Whenever you got hair standing on the pole of the bull, it's a period of low or no fertility. Um, don't know what else to get there. Okay, so a number of different things. I'm going to talk about most of these. I'm trying to go kind of fast, but uh, a great big one in this area, I'm letting you read these, but a great big one is this early shedding. I was talked about the middle of March here, a time to go out and look at the, your towels. The ones that tend to shed the earliest are the ones that have the best hormonal or glandular function, all right? So from now until you get on, if you've got replacement heifers you've already chosen, if they haven't shed off by the time you're getting ready to put the bull in, you're kind of wasting your time. They might get pregnant this year, but they'll be the ones that either breed really late next year or don't get pregnant. So pay attention to that. I, this uh, early shedding is a big one for me. So I'm going to talk about a number of different things, which are all these different traits. Okay, and the more you, more of them you've got, the more certain you can be <coughs> that you've got the trait you're looking for. When we had single trait select, we sometimes don't get what we're looking for. Um, this cow here, I was down in uh, East Texas last spring, and, and I don't know if you can see in the background rougher hair coats and stuff, but he had this one cow that's not built right. I wish there was a lot more body to her. I wish that her, her chest came down about this low and still had that wedge. But man, she had glandular function. She had the shiniest hair coat. You can't really see it in this picture, but these vertical folds in her hide, I mean, usually you'll see them in the neck. On her, they came clear back here to her flank. Loose hide, vertical folds, loose hide, tender meat, lots of butter fat. Um, that's wrong, wrong button. So her thymus, generally the bigger that is, it's a general indicator of overall health. It can, maybe I better stop and say, the rougher the hair coats are, mineral problem, something like that, the, in the winter, these things are harder to see. The better the hair coat in the summertime, the easier these things are going to be to see. This was probably late March or early April when I was down there. Um, but that thymus expression in the, on the neck, I don't know if you can see this area right here. Uh, that hair is all running uphill. I was at a Dexter thing last June, I guess it was, and we just had walked in the barn. There was a girl trimming her steer, and just as I got there, she turned the, the shears the other way, and I go, why did you turn the shears the other way? And she goes, well, the hair grows the opposite direction there. And I go, do you want to know why? Anyway, so I was telling her about this, but this hair looks like you took a paintbrush or something and painted that all up. That's why it has a darker look to it. Um, anyway, kind of enough about that. So adrenal hair whorl, I'll borrow your cap. So on the, on the back of the animal, there's, a, there's a, an area where the hair is going 360 degrees, like from the center of this cap, those, those ridges that go out the side. You really want that in the shoulder blade area or further forward. That's gonna tell you more butter fat in her milk, more tender meat if you're direct marketing the meat. Um, this pancreatic hair whorl, I've got an arrow, but you see a line here this dark. There'll be a little bit more on that later, but hair whorl, uh, hair's growing in a different direction. This pancreatic, the hair <coughs> coming down the side, it's all going downhill, this is coming uphill, and they meet in a little wave along the side. That little wave is sticking out right here. 
when she, when she's open that's all in an area like this you, a steer has a pancreas his is going to be in a little area like that when she gets pregnant that'll start growing up into the armpit back into the flank and up the side this one is a kind of an average presentation i've got some pictures of some pretty dramatic ones coming up here in a little bit her stifle muscle the earlier in life you see this stifle muscle on a on a heifer calf or a bull the more fertile they are and, uh, the, the sex hormones i should say oops did something again uh fine cannon bone on this one you can't quite see it i think i've got a little air a line there but the flatter that is uh, the back leg if there's the backbone and here's the ground you know you're looking at a cross section of that back leg if, if it's rounded like that <coughs> less butter fat tougher meat if it's if it's kind of a u like this it's uh it, it's pretty good but if you've got it on the outside if you've got it dipped in like that now that's a lot of butter fat that's going to be really tender meat and they're linked together and it's all part of the hormonal system what i want to show in here with this dotted line is sex hormones shut off long bone growth taller cattle in general are producing fewer sex hormones than shorter cattle <coughs> estrogen shuts it off in the front end first testosterone shuts it off in the back end first so we want a cow that looks like she's walking downhill on level ground we're choosing replacement heifers we want replacement heifers that look like they're shorter in the front end than the back end um, uh, how many in here have read Bonsma or have a copy of Bonsma lectures okay uh, interesting book but on page about five or six in there he's got a picture of two twin bull calves they castrated one at two years uh, at six months of age and the other one at two years well, the one that was still intact he shut off long bone growth and it was dramatically different the size of these two animals but he was bragging on this picture or this drawing in there it was just black and white that it was a, an, an excellent example of all the hormonal things that had come that come into play and what i really noticed was the length of the horns on the on the bull calf that had been castrated at six months of age were about 50 percent longer than the one that had been castrated at two years where the the sex hormones had shut off hadn't even thought about it before bones i mean horns long bone growth so uh everything else being equal a cow with long horns i mean you know long horns versus red agus versus you know i mean you got to stay in your breed but uh if you've got two two cows out there and one cow has longer horns than the other one that the one with the shorter horns they're both six years old probably uh, produced more fertile uh so patch of hair growing in the opposite direction i kind of talked about this uh the adrenal hair or we like it to be there or further forward this is a great big pancreatic hair whorl about uh six weeks after i took the picture she just had her calf two or three days earlier all of this had collapsed back down to about that big about six weeks after that uh that bull on the right there you've seen here a couple more pancreatic hair whorls you know left they're close to calving um more of a dot there, but there's still a slight part there but that was an awfully good cow in the world am i doing wrong um okay so uh adrenal hair whorl and then a pointed pole i was reading a book by a veterinarian that was written in 1868 hewitt and uh he talked about this pointed pole i hadn't heard about it before well that next spring i'm out fixing fence i get to the pasture that the grass bats are in and yeah, I'm one of those stuck. Uh, anyway, uh, pretty quick, I've got an audience, you know, so I'm standing up and I'm stretching my back and it's like point and pull, point and pull, point and pull. 
every animal in there except for one had a pointed pole and I didn't even know to look for it. Last fall, I was looking for all these other things that uh, Gerald had taught about tender meat. Um, this, uh, I was, I had a picture of uh, happy lines, and you'll see probably a blow up of that tomorrow. But I was wanted this guy to put his hand here. The, this is a welt. It's a hormonal expression. It's not like these are divots. Uh, it's a hormonal expression here. But then when I blew it up to show somebody, I was looking at these vertical folds. This is a bull. It's like, man, I want that one for a herd sire because he's going to give more butter fat to all of his daughters. And if you get two adrenal hair whorls, the head is over here on this particular animal. You use the front one, but you don't see that very often. Um, so the thymus, I have... I don't know that I've ever seen a bigger thymus expression. Um, cannon bone, I'll get to that just on the next slide. A U-shaped versus a V-shaped brisket. Um, I'll get into linear measurement here in a little bit, but uh, measuring around a V versus a U that's the same distance off the ground is going to give you a larger number when you go to measure heart girth. And in this discussion, there's a, I think there's a slide coming up uh, about that. That one I thought was rather unique because this Doberman pincer look, I'd never seen one like that before. A guy was wanting some information about these cannon bones, so I tried to use the keyboard to get across the, uh, the idea. And if you notice, the width between the, the, uh, the, the size of the knee here versus I spaced it out a little bit over here on this side. Uh, I went to a guy's place to help somebody else pick out some uh, cows that he was going to buy and the guy showed me, the owner showed me this 1200 plus pound part short horn steer and I usually like short horns and I'm like, I, I quit what I do it and I said, whatever you do, do not cut a steak out of that animal. You will lose 10 customers for every one you, I mean it's really, really going to be tough meat. Uh, just grind the whole animal. <clears throat> anyway, uh, something's coming up here in a slide on hooves, but uh, where the right to, uh, right front hoof, outside toe, inside toe, the more the toes are straight together, the better off. If they're out like this or they're curved like they're going to hold your coffee cup, that's not a good thing. Yeah, here we are. So I just kind of blew up the uh, the center of this. So you, what I was just describing there, the angles and the, the toes straight forward, you get those, you tend to get more of this toe thing, the number seven and beyond, when the animal is too narrow on that end. Uh, and anybody, I see you taking a picture, you're welcome to the slides. If anybody has a thumb drive or something, you're welcome. I think that uh, it's on the computer, so whomever owns the computer can can download that for you. Um, anyway, the more the uh, that end, front or back end of the animal is too narrow, the more they're going to stand with their toes out. I'll get into this more in a minute with the linear measurement. Anyway, I thought it was a pretty good uh, graphic. Uh, and then uh, tender meat and um, butter fat. Uh, they have their own indicators, but they're also related to uh, <clears throat> hormonal function. I don't know if you can see the concave in this in this bone. This is a be a rib bone, and of course the jaw bone oops, being dished versus convex on the top there. Um, and then a loose hide would be the same. You, you remember the picture with the guy's hand there and all the vertical folds? That would have been a very loose hide if you can't get your hands on them. If you see those vertical folds, you know it's a loose hide. So the 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 uh, is it uh, Kobe beef where they uh, massage the the animals? They say with beer, they feel like that massaging helps them marble better. Well, if you've got an animal that has a loose hide like that, every time they stay, take a step their whole life, their hide is massaging. They should marvel. They do marvel better. But their daughters, your cows, more butterfat, more butterfat, more backfat. They get through the winter easier. 
Um, and then another one that I just learned about the other day, this, uh, the fellow that uh, with the two bones there, the two rib bones in his hand, is Peter Chilcott from um, Australia. He, he pointed out the difference in these two tails and how the one on the right here, or the left here, yeah. Uh, is is going to be more butter fat, more tender meat. The one on the right is going to be less butter fat, less tender meat. Um, this, you know, the, the French government in 1848 said, if you follow what this Francois Guignon, like filet mignon, if you follow that treatise, there need be no doubt. This is not an EPD. There need be no doubt as to whether, I hate reading this, a cow is a good milker, or if you went to somebody's place to buy one, you could tell with certainty that that one that you wanted to bring home would be a good milker. It took him about 30 years to figure out this system, the, the milch cow by Francois Guillemot. And uh, they reprint it now. I think you probably get it for $20 or something. Pretty good book, lots and lots of pictures. It was, it was made around dairy, but the the shape of this discussion, hopefully I've got my little, no, darn it. Uh, <laughs> it. The more there's an up angle to this spade, the part that goes in the ground, okay, the spade and the shovel, the more there's an up angle, like your foot would, you're gonna, you're gonna dig a hole and your foot would tend to slide in towards the handle, that's more butter fat. That's not in that book. Gerald was running around with his ultrasound. He found the book, read the book, started looking at ultras or at uh, the back end of cattle, and then he's looking at what he's reading with the ultrasound. He figured out that an up angle here is more butter fat, and a down angle is less. This one here comes down and kind of goes out, and on this side it, it comes out and down. Uh, really wide handle. The taller that handle is, the earlier in lactation she'll come into full milk production. And the wider the handle is, the longer she'll stay at high milk production. If you've got a cow that's just got a short one and only comes up about this high and it's the width of my thumb, as soon as she gets bred, she'll fall off dramatically in milk production. So you'll have cows who have calves and they look pretty good until they're about three months of age and then they start falling off. You go, well, it's, it's hot, it's lignified feed and those things do have an effect. But if you go back and look, at, some don't fall off and some do. Go back and look at the back end of mom. See if you can make a relationship there with, and the book's pretty easy to find. Bald udder, uh, Again, uh, more butter fat, more tender meat, easier to put on back fat, easier to get through a North Dakota winter. Dick Divin, low cost cow calf. Anybody in here follow him when he was alive? You know, he had nine levels of energy in one of his uh, deals. And, and I only see, I think, one or two hands go up I got a, a, one winter I decided I wanted to know what he was saying, it was, it was some interesting stuff, so I read every newsletter that he'd ever published on his website, and then I made a really long word document of what I thought the highlights were. And, and this chart that he has, not this, is in there about these nine levels of, of energy. Well, then, then I, all by myself, discovered you can get them too fast to get pregnant. I think there's a few others that have figured that out too. It's not a deal that you're going to find very often. All the bad stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask Dr. Ballerstadt this afternoon to, to step in when I'm talking, but all of the bad stuff has an affinity for the fat. We were talking earlier about grain-fed versus grass-fed. I, I, Personally, I do the grass-fed or grass-finished. As long as it's mineral-rich and no toxins, pesticides, herbicides, antibiotics, hormones, and 
toxins all have an affinity for the fat you get a cow too fat her own fat gobbles up the the estrogen or excuse me the progesterone that was supposed to support that corpus luteum and she just rebreeds and rebreeds and rebreeds and she can't stay pregnant if she's too fat um, hormonal function in in well starting probably in a month then month and a half you're going to be able to see the cows that have the best hormonal function they maintain and and most adapted to your environment they main their maintain their body condition now this is everything else being equal they all had a calf they, they all weaned the calves at the same time blah 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 she she maintained body condition uh she was that one with the kind of the velveteen rabbit on the hair coat through the winter and then she started <coughs> shedding that long hair early in the in the late winter shall we call it um so trying to get through i decided not to do that there's a cow with a lot going on here she's kind of like that other black cow what i wanted oops wrong one uh what she doesn't have is that wedge shape and i'm going to get into this wedge shape now but this is a big thing that bondsman talked about uh he, he was a he was pretty well known quite a few years ago what was it the late 60s and early 70s he came to the u.s until they kicked him out and said don't come back because he was telling you all these things that we're talking about today and it was taking money out of the people that were funding all the research at the universities and they didn't want him to come back anymore anyway i wish that this cow i mean she's plenty beefy she has that little shadow i was talking about with my thumb i was trying to show you what that back cannon bone would look like she's got it you can see the shadow here you don't see that very often so she had a lot of quality going on normally this cow's going to get too fat and not take care of a good calf but she had enough of the good stuff she she just was was doing that so um three <coughs> things to keep in mind uh ken redmond uh, who in here has heard of carney redmond burl winchester the burl winchester was linear measuring sheep he was at uh, montana state and uh carney redman heard about him went and saw a uh, talk afterwards he says hey can we do this same thing with cattle yeah i'm sure we can figure it out so they did a bunch of stuff well about that time carney's grandson ken was just getting out of school he drove grandpa around and he was the math whiz and he did all the regressions and derivatives and what they needed but he was the one that figured out how all this stuff the differences it made and in 1991 he got his uh, I, I guess PhD I don't know maybe his master's at uh, Colorado State and he uh, the paper that he had to write was all on obviously linear measuring three things that he found with old cows in anybody's herd from mexico to canada he has data was 9500 head of cows three things they're going to have a bigger belly than the herd average they can eat enough for three they were going to have a wide butt which michael mcdonald said the the best indicator of fertility in her cow is how much wider her butt is than the length of it and then slope from hook to pins that pelvis is tilted enough to be able to get the calf out um i was surprised when i saw this picture of that cow in a, in a sale catalog i mean she's not shed out <laughs> she's standing in the shade but there's nowhere near enough depth of body in that in that cow somebody's bragging on that cow in the sale catalog <coughs> um anyway so this is one of ken's uh deals old cows they've had 10 or 11 calves in a row the rump width is as that line goes up it's uh it's it's wider than the average of the herd uh oops i don't know what i'm doing maybe i'm 
pointing at the wrong thing. So a cow with a wide butt. And you know, another thing, you don't want a bubble butt. You, it needs to go straight down. You know, you get this, they're gonna be less fertile. Okay, we're just, we're talking with. I'm pointing at the wrong thing, I think. Uh, Michael McDonald. 40% of our profit is if we have a calf every year. Linear measurement wise, we're leaving out the hormonal function from the first part of the talk. Linear measurement wise, the two best numbers, how much wider the rump is than its length. Where are we at on time? 15 or 20 minutes. Okay, won't tell that story. So here's that same cow that uh, there were the outline was from Bonsma that had the arrows going both ways. There's just, there's no need to be any beefier than that cow, but man, she had a lot of stuff going on for her. So about four years, I was down in uh, Southern Utah, Don Faulkner University of Arizona State, I guess, University of Arizona. We're getting really good at predicting percent of body weight that a group of dry cows, yearlings, cows <coughs> eat, depending on what we're feeding them. But what we can't tell you is what individual cattle animals are eating in those groups. Some are eating twice as much as others. If it's a 3% of body weight average, some cows were eating 2% of their body weight, some were eating 4. Um, and then Anibal, Poor Domingo, who in here gets a Stockton grass farmer? Okay, so you may have read something by him. First time he hears Gerald talk, he goes back, he got his PhD at uh, New Mexico State, he goes back, gets his research data out, and goes, wow, I, this average is 55. My, I, my right foot is in ice and my left foot is in boiling water. My average temperature is 120. <laughs> He found some cattle were digesting 70, 40. I mean, that's almost that double. Some were eating twice as much as others. Now, I'll get into how we improve this at the end of the talk. But, but the big belly, the big belly, the flank, uh, old cows, the flank, that was one of those three things that Ken talked about. Um, and see how I put 10 to 15 versus 2 to 7? You get cows with a big belly and they're going to last a long time because was it two years in a row you've had a, a drought here in the North Dakota or was it just not last summer but the summer before it was pretty darn dry I remember. The cows that bred back then, I mean go look at the ones that, that made it through that. They, they're going to fit three criteria but for that it was probably the one with a big belly and she had a higher digestion percentage. Um, okay, so 30% is, is what you've got to feed a cow a year in your profit. Um, just some pictures of different animals and I'll just go by that. Um, so with the, with the cow in the middle there, we're looking for a cow that's walking downhill on level ground, but we need a wedge. Her, her flank has got to be bigger than her girth. Uh, back to Ken's graph there, the last one we just had, but we need it not from just the side, but we need to see it from the top too. The front end is not as wide as the back end on the cow. Um, so I just did a little math here. We got a 1300 pound cow eating 26 pounds versus the other one eating 40. A uh, thousand pound cow, people say, I want a thousand pound cow. No, I want a cow that eats a smaller percent of her body weight. It's not an, an absolute size. <sighs> you think I've learned. So I want to use that bull on top to breed the cow on the bottom to, to correct a lot of imbalances. Um, and if you've got cows, you know, the average of your herd, the backbone sticking up a couple inches above the shoulder blades when they're just standing there. A bull like this, whose shoulder blades are slightly higher than the background, he's gonna change your cow herd dramatically in one generation. Ah. Um, so this is out of uh, the best book I've ever read, if you already know something about a cow. Factors Affecting Calf Crop. Uh, Coger was the original author. Um, they're hard to come by. If you don't live in Florida, start reading in chapter 6.
if you live in Florida, I don't see any hands going up. You can start at the beginning, but you'll think I'm crazy if you start at the beginning. Start at six if you get a ha your hands on a copy. There's a PDF you can download for free, but they cost quite a bit. Anyway, in this in this one, I guess I'll move over here so you can see that. The on your right, that uh, shoulder blade is standing more straight up and down. And you remember the bull picture where his uh, shoulder blades were above his backbone? He's more like the one on the right. Uh, this is a uh, longevity and a fertility indicator. And this is kind of, this is Bonsma stuff right here. The more angled back that shoulder blade, the less fertile the cow. I just blew them up. You see the back edge of the shoulder blade is even with about the fourth number four spinous process versus the one on the right, it's even with the third. Uh, just something to look at there. This was a, from a picture before, kind of an emaciated cow, so it's not a good example. So for the bull, the importance is on white shoulders. And the bull, it's the width of the shoulders for fertility, and the cow, it's the width of the rump. Uh, sex hormones again in the bull the testosterone shuts off long bone growth in the back end uh, and then oops i didn't like the drawing i don't know who did the drawing i don't know like anything about it there is a book james drayson uh, wrote a book called herd bull fertility so i just took his drawing of a first perfect set of testicles and i changed the quality oops darn it <laughs> i changed the quality of that bull by changing what was hanging down there um, so girth, I, uh, we're looking at the, on the right hand side there where the, uh, the back hoof is landing where the front one goes, uh, again out of a bondsma, the, that, that last, uh, rib pointing towards the hawk, somewhere between here and here. If it's pointing out here in front, they're less fertile. What he's, this is crazy, I'm, I was pointing at that machine. Uh, with this, you see how the shoulder blade doesn't quite come to the backbone versus it does here. More fertile on the bottom, less fertile on the top. Bit too much dairy look for us. I would like the chest to be deeper, but I don't want to get rid of the wedge on the bottom side. I don't want it. I don't want to go this this low and be flat all the way across there. Um, I just took a cow, and you can see in between those two ribs the angle that's going to be out in front of where her hoof would have been here on the ground if you could see it copper bump she didn't have enough copper as a young animal and it gets expressed she's not going to pass that along either either she wasn't getting enough or something in her environment was tying up the copper that was there um, and and if uh, your cattle this time of year their hair is all frizzed out we can't see these ribs but if they're hungry in the morning when you go out to feed, you can see how deep down that triangle is. That's going to give you a, a, an idea of the angle of her rib. Oops. Uh, so thorough, which is actually a different measurement, but I'm using it to talk about slope from hook to pins. Okay, hook bones, the big knobby bone that sticks out up in front of the whole pelvis, and then the pin bones on both sides of the tail. Cows that have had cows that have had 10 or 11 calves in a row have more slope from hooks to pins than the herd average. So I took pictures here. We've got a we've got a cow. Let me make sure. So there's where her front hoof landed. Okay. Then she comes along, and her right rear hoof lands just outside and just behind her front hoof. I'm looking at that, riding my horse behind this cow, and I'm going, without seeing the rest of her, oh, her back end is wider than her front end. In here, she's not splayed out, the toes splayed out to the side, so her front end isn't exceedingly narrow. As long as the toes are straight forward on both ends of the animal, you're in pretty good shape. And then for a bull, I kind of keep fouling myself up. Uh, I just want you to know this is the out, the, the hind hoof. So we've got the front hoof here. The right rear hoof comes and lands 
excuse yeah the uh, this is the wider stance on the front the right rear hoof comes and lands just about the same fore and aft but it lands inside we've got a bull with wider shoulders than than his back sorry that was a little bit hard i had to think about it this one here they one landed on top of the other still the toes are going fairly well straight forward and then this one here's the front hoof the back hoof we're short stepping uh less meat a little harder to have a calf that sort of thing um this is out of bonsma again and long bone growth well i hadn't even thought about it before until i saw that horn deal see how much thicker this tail process is right here versus this one over here and then of course we've got the slope from hook to pins hook to pin versus hook to pin the one on the right more fertile and going to be able to have that calf i took this photo because it was such a long ways back to this to the joint instead of being halfway from here to here on this one it was like 60 percent of the way back and then oh with the circle hook bones even with the backbone in a level plane across there you've heard people talk in the past about a, a what a dinner plate back there on the back a lot of the cows these days have a raised tail process that whole grow bone sticks up it slopes off to both hook bones from the backbone um, so how what time we got i can okay i'm just going to go these are some things you can do that bigger flank the wider rump the girth equal to the top line uh, 10 month weaning thing let's talk about that a little later i want to get into uh rumen development and i look at it a little different than most people um back to animal deal weston ate rice not what we eat but what we digest it matters um mike uh don faulkner again just did a little bit more math there's a uh, a fellow in uh Arizona he called me about four years ago in August and said normally I have to wean my first calf heifers at three to four months of age because the heifers don't breed back and he said but they're not losing weight this year like they normally do and I go well did you change your mineral was it a wet year you know trying to take out any of the epigenetics that I could think about and finally I said well Kelly how long did you leave those heifers on their mother and he was just silence for about five or ten minutes and then he he started minutes seconds then he started laughing and he goes that was the first year that i left the replacement heifers on their mother for 10 months most instances you do this the cows you have now really can't nourish them that well you might have to put them in a different group and feed those cows a little more i'm just gonna pick a number out of the air and say if it's fifty dollars for the next 10 12 15 years in your herd that replacement heifer will save you that 50 bucks you're looking at it this year a lot of people do oh i don't want to spend that 50 dollars on that cow the marginal efficiency of capital the marginal efficiency of cows i can spend a dollar today and get 10 or 12 or 15 back you couldn't pay kelly a fellow in, in uh, arizona uh a hundred dollars to wean early now uh, just some pictures. I wish that I had uh, taken this. Uh, we were harvesting that day and it had sat there for about 30 minutes. It's like, hey, cut this open. Let's wash this out. It's just a two year old steer there, the inside of a room in there. Uh, development versus lack of development. Uh, I don't know what I'm hitting. I'm hitting the button down below. So Kelly sent me this picture. We got two breeds on this place, one that can winter herself, do without grass and water all summer and make money, the other we just tip our hat to and lose our shirts. Um, so thinking about the difference in percent of body weight that they're eating, I just took 1,500 pounds and um, you know how many cows you can run. Um, and if they're smaller, that's a plus two uh bald udder how would how would the day a heifer is born would you know she was going to have a bald udder place about the size of the palm of your hand there would be a shorter nappier uh, lighter colored hair there good chance she's going to have a bald udder uh 
four teats, five teats, six teats, extra teats is more butter fat. Um, the, the escutcheon, we, the point and pull, place me in the adrenal hair wall, the day they're born, you can see all those things. You can also see them the day you go to make your, your selections, the ones that had their um, stifle muscle stick out earlier. The ones who looked like they were walking downhill would be ones. The ones who, that next spring shed earlier, rump two and a half inches wider, flank two inches or more. I think Ken said he found a milk cow in Canada that was a